Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about capturing and processing images of Comet 12P Mons Brooks with the emphasis more on processing than capturing since the capturing techniques will um, really not vary from uh, however else you normally capture your images. I used my C-Star S50 for this. It was extremely convenient. Um, of course, if you have an S50, which I recommend, uh, you know that capturing images is very easy. Um, what I will say as far as capturing, um, Comet 12P Pons Brooks is very low in the sky at sunset. It's off to the west northwest. So you will want to make sure that you have a unobstructed view um, in that direction, preferably from elevation, so you have as much time on target as possible, because you, you won't have... Uh, much time on it once the sun is down. I'll say that I took these images, um, you see from the dates here, a few weeks ago, uh, March 11th. Um, at that point, I was able to get um, about 30 minutes uh, time in one session. Um, I'll say that uh, I've been better prepared. I probably could have gotten a few more minutes on target. And one thing you'll have working in your favor now versus then is that I think it's about two orders of magnitude brighter uh, now than it was then. I think it was roughly magnitude seven uh, when I took these images, and now it's uh, like magnitude 4.9. So it's actually quite a bit brighter. That you may be able to uh, see it with a pair of binoculars from your yard or certainly from a uh, dark location. One more thing I'll, I'll add is that. You know, whether using an S50 or a telescope on a go-to mount, you want to make sure that you know most of the time uh, go-to software will try to perfectly center a target in the image. Because of the comet's uh, long tail, which you can't see in the single frame you see on my screen right now, but it's going off in this direction, you want to get as much of that tail as possible. So you actually want to adjust um, the alignment of the or the targeting of the comet so that it's more in a corner. Um, you can't, of course, see the bright head of the comet right here in the part of the image. And once it's stacked, that tail will be very easy to see. I'm using, as you can see, a Deep Sky Sacker for stacking. Of course, you can use any stacking tool you prefer. <clears throat> but you'll need to make sure that you pick something with a comet mode. I'll go ahead and register the images. I'm going to use uh, image of the best score as my reference. And what you need to do a couple things to make sure that you do a good comet stack. So you'll need to, over on the right here, make sure you choose uh, edit comet mode. And it will light up in green uh, things that, in the image which it thinks, uh, things which might be a comet, which is uh, going to be the comet itself plus every single bright star in the image, as you can see. So what we want to do is just click on the actual comet. It'll put this nice purple circle around it. Unfortunately, we'll need to repeat the process of selecting the comet on every single image, um, which as you can imagine is pretty tedious. Um, done a few of these already. Keep going through. And finding the ones that I have not done it. It really and truly is every bit as tedious as you would think it is. I am not going to bore you by making you watch me click through all 92 of these images. Uh, so I'm going to skip ahead. Once you have uh, gone through and set up the comment on all the images, I do recommend to go ahead and just blink through all the images. This is a double check to make sure that they have all been selected because it is easy to uh, skip over them just clicking through a list. And the easy way to do that is just click into the file list or the image list and just uh, arrow through the list and it will show you every image. Yep, there's one I missed. All 
All right, now they're all selected. Now, what I'm going to do is check our settings. I'm going to go to settings, under options, then second settings. Um, for this, I'm going to use I'm going to use intersection mode and enable 2x drizzle. Um, and drizzle is a way to upscale the image and add more resolution. And next we want to go to the comet tab. And there are three ways to stack the image. Standard stacking will align the images on the stars, which will give you nice sharp stars. But because the comet is actually moving against the background stars, because it is a solar object, and it's actually right now fairly close to the Earth and moving very quickly, so even over the course of a few minutes, it will shift against the background stars. So you'll get pinpoint stars, but the star itself will be fuzzy because um, basically you have motion blur from it moving across the background. There is comet stacking where it lines on the comet and gives you a nice sharp comet with uh, trailing stars. And there is stars plus comet stacking where it will attempt to give you a sharp comet against sharp background of stars. Um, I have not had much luck with this myself, but your mileage may vary. Um, but I prefer comet stacking anyway because I like having that sense of motion um, with a sharp comet by having the starch trailing show you how much it's actually moved against the background in a shorter period of time, which I think it's cool. So I will click OK with that and I'll go ahead and stack the images. OK, I have opened the image in Serral. Uh, and this is a completely normal way for it to look. I stacked the image in Deep, Deep Sky Stacker using the mosaic mode. So it's going to grab all of the screen real estate it can and this rotation, uh, you've seen the images from the field rotation uh, from all the images combined as the comet set below the horizon. It's completely normal for the image to have this uh, green cast to it. I'm going to switch from linear to auto stretch. Um, so you can see the bright head of the comet right here and this green, really green uh, background, which is Completely normal, don't worry about that if you see it. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the image, click rotate and crop. So I'm going to grab the borders of the uh, crop area and bring it in until um, I've gotten all of, uh, as much of these, the solid bright stack as I can. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and rotate the image just a bit so I can get a little bit more. So I'm back into rotating crop. Um, I'm going to rotate it counterclockwise about one degree, probably, maybe two. Apply that. Uh, let's try one more degree. Okay, that's good. So now I will resize the area uh, for the crop. Bring that up a bit more. All right, that looks pretty good. I'm going to click apply uh, the crop. All right, that's good. Now we're going to Take care of the green color by doing a color calibration. Normally I would do a photometric color calibration, which will do a place solve on the image, um, compare it to a section of the sky and calibrate the image according to known color values of the stars in that image. Um, because, of, because of how this image was stacked, um, giving the star trails, I can't use that method. So I'll do color calibration. And what you're gonna to want to do is draw a very small uh, rectangle over what looks like the darkest part of the image. 
click on Use Current Selection in your Color Collaboration dialog box, and then click Background Neutralization. And there we have a collaborated image that we can use. Click Apply. Oops, I actually did that. Uh, undo. There we go. So um, now you can see. Well, already we have, of course, the bright head, um, which shows up much nicer now, and the distinct tail of the comet. And of course, what you can also see is this very stark uh, light gradient in the background. And that's because my neighbor had a very bright security light on uh, that was eliminating the edge of the field for the S50 when I took these images. But it's okay. Serial has the tools to help us take care of that. So what I'm going to do next is a background extraction. And what you're going to want to do is click um, uh, generate. I'm going to generate um, the grids of boxes. And basically these are sample boxes. So it's going to sample all of the areas of the image under the boxes and use that to analyze the gradient and then uh, remove it. So what you want to be very careful of is to make sure that you don't have any of the comet or its tail under the sample boxes. So what you can do is if you right click anywhere on the image, it will remove the Sample square uh, nearest to where you right clicked. So I'm just going to go through rapidly right clicking and make sure I give uh, the comet, uh, comet's head and its tail a very wide berth. So I'm going to remove a roughly cone shaped section of the sample boxes around the comet's tail. And with that done, just click uh, Compute Background. And if you're wondering what these sliders are for, that just uh, tells it uh, their settings for how it generates these grids of sample boxes. Click Apply, and you can see the gradient is gone. Now, it is completely normal at this point for the image to be uh, very noisy. Um, one of the downsides of uh, shooting this particular comment, at least, is that you know, you're not able to get hours of data to uh, bring the noise way down. So we're going to be relying uh, pretty heavily on noise reduction in Serial. So just click that in the image processing menu. And I'm going to do a few iterations of uh, noise reduction while the image is still linear. The image appears stretched because I have switched from linear to auto, auto stretch. If go back to linear, you'll see that um, it's basically at this point a black image with only the head of the comet visible, which again is completely normal because as you can see in the auto stretch, as I saw, the data is all there. It's just uh, the brightness values are very low right now. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do noise reduction and take a little, little while to do the noise reduction. It's a pretty intensive process. Uh, I'm going to do a couple stages of noise reduction. If you're wondering why there's these gaps in my star trails, um, it's because uh, two things. One is in the middle of the session, I accidentally stopped the stack and I had to restart it and it went through the um, rise and leveling process. So I lost a minute or two of exposure time there. And because there were a few bad uh, subs that I rejected and didn't attack. I'm gonna do noise again. And 
And I'm not going to... Uh, we're not going to be able to, to get rid of all of the noise. I'm going to make sure I get rid of enough noise that I can uh, stretch the image quite a bit to have a clearly visible uh, tail in the comet. What you don't want to do is do noise so much that we start losing the definition on these sections of the comet's tail, where we have right now fairly distinct and sharp lines. Um, the more you do noise, the fuzzier those lines are going to get. Um, so I, I'd like to try and avoid that. All right, I think we're hitting diminishing returns on the denoise, denoise process. So I'm going to leave it right there. Just click close. Now I will switch from auto stretch to linear and begin actually stretching the image. So the first thing, the first thing I'm going to do is go to the assign transformation. Uh, bring up the stretch factor by quite a bit. Start bringing up the black point. Now, depending on your image, um, a, there's a tiny bit of black point. It might go a long way. In fact, sometimes I don't raise the black point at all at this step. Uh, sometimes you need quite a bit. In any case, um, I always want to make sure that I am not... Uh, raising the black point so much that I'm actually clipping the image. Uh, so if I, yeah, you see, see at a po certain point and very quickly, we're getting further and you're losing the image. So if I uh, click apply now with the black point where it is now, um, this image, uh, you know, that all of that data, all this, the rest of the head, the stars, the tail would just be gone, I'd have to undo to get them back. Um, so I'm gonna back off on the black point. And I always err on the side of caution in setting the black point in this step. Uh, so that looks pretty good, I'm gonna click apply. And now I'm gonna go into the histogram transformation. And if you're not familiar with image editing, a histogram is a Graph of the distribution of brightness values among the pixels in your image. So the the x-axis is the uh, represents the brightness. So the farther to the right, um, the graph values are it's representing uh, brighter pixels in the image, and the vertical is the how many pixels in the image are at that brightness level. So we have this, obviously, this very high peak and a very narrow range of brightness, which matches our image, which is mainly, you know, kind of uh, uniform gray across most of the pixels in the image. So what we're going to do is drag the black triangle on the far left, which is the black, uh, black point uh, slider, and we're going to bring it up close to, but not um, intersecting with the peak in the graph, because we, again, we don't want to lose any data in the image. And you'll see that the image is getting clearer. Um, the pixels are getting uh, darker and increasing contrast. Um, and we're gonna do that again. Every time you click apply, it's gonna do redistribute the graph and it was difficult times. Okay, uh, that's fine now. I'm going to start stretching the image by sliding this middle triangle that's gray uh, to the left. It represents the midpoint. And you'll see that as I slide it, um, this line curves. So these are sometimes called uh, curves tools, these kind of stretches. Um, you know, you'll see it called curves and tools like Photoshop and many others. Um, and what it's doing is it's adjusting the brightness values of pixels in a non-linear fashion. So you know, if you use something like um, increase the exposure, um, use that exposure tool in 
tools like Photoshop or GIMP. Um, what it's doing is increasing the brightness values of all the pixels in your image by a fixed uniform amount, which is not what we want to do here. We want to kind of selectively brighten the pixels. We want to brighten the darkest pixels very little. We want to focus our brightening on uh, the peak in the graph is getting wider and actually stretching out the distribution of brightness in the pixels. Um, but you always want to try and take these stretches in, you know, uh, small increments. So I'm going to bring that back. I will apply that. And bring in the black point again. And this point is basically a iterative process of stretching and raising the black point until you get the image where you want it to be roughly. Again, balancing the brightness of the comment and its tail against the uh, level of noise being generated. All right, now it looks like the stars, the tar star trails have a bit of a green tint. I think the head of the comet is a bit greener than it should be. I'm going to uh, do another uh, color calibration. Try a different part of the image. Hit that. Not bad. I want to bring the green down a bit more. I'm going to do manual white balance. And yeah, I've already slid down the green slider just a bit. I'm going to click apply. Uh, do it again. And I think one more time. All right. I think that is looking pretty good. Okay, I want to go back into the Instagram collaboration. I want to just very carefully, I want to bring up the white point or the black point, I should say. And this is so carefully so that I want to, um, Make the background darker <clears throat> without um, removing any of the comet tail. Alright, I'll leave that about there. Click apply and close. As far as the serial processing goes, uh, that's about it. Um, I don't have anything else in serial. Um, from here, it's pretty much up to you, uh, how much you want to process the image. Um, it is already a pretty nice image, but if you wanted to, you know, you could open this up and, you know, Photoshop or GIMP or whatever your fa your favorite image editing tool is, and, you know, maybe work more on, um, uh, noise reduction, playing with the contrast, uh, everything you can do in those tools to take it a bit further. But I think that um, that's where I'm going to stop um, process for this image. You can see that you know the, the flow for comment processing is pretty similar to what you would do for anything else. It, but the stacking is quite a bit different for comments versus any other deep sky object. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please like and subscribe.